And hello, everybody. Welcome to our 100th episode of Safest Family on the Block. I want to thank everybody who's come here for the live show and the live Q&A. And we've got both fans and guests coming in today to ask questions and answer them. I'll let y'all figure out which of you is doing which. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. We have a few minutes before our first guest, Gary Quesenberry, comes on officially. And I first want to talk about a couple of things. First, uh, first of those being that season five will be starting up week after next. So episode 101 is already on the docket. We've got a lot of, a lot of experts talking about safety, about medical response, about martial arts. We're also adding elder safety to our, to our subjects. And the first one's with a guy, one of those old school guys who's a Tai Chi master and a, and a physics professor, because there's a surprising number of guys with those two credentials. I never figured out why, but it's certainly a thing. Uh, talking about balance and balance drills you can practice even as you get older and that we can teach our, our elders so that you know they don't fall down and get hurt. So that's exciting coming down the pike. And then also just wanted to mention the Patreon page. If you love this show and you have $3 a month, please do consider going on there and signing up to back us. And it's, you know, what is that? Like 10 cents a day or something to help make this program go a little bit better. If you go on there, you'll see what I plan to do with the money. The first one is, is improving the gear. So the sound quality and video quality is better. Next one is hiring some minions so that I have some people who are better at video editing than I am, editing videos, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, that's, hold on one second. Somebody is having trouble logging in. I'll see what I can do about that. See, this is a time when minions would have been helpful. <laughs> All right. But we're gonna have our first guest in about seven minutes and I wanna open the floor to questions. Who's got, so go ahead and let's use the chat for questions so we don't have to keep fiddling with our, with our, muting and unmuting. I'll go ahead and open the chat. So somebody asked a question or I'll just start making stuff up and pretend somebody asked a question. Uh, which book have I recommended most in the last year? So I've got two answers to that question. Um, actually just the one, uh, The Safety Trap by Spencer Corsi. Now, uh, Spencer spent the better part of a decade running ops for uh, Gavin DeBecker and Associates and intentionally set out to write the book that's going to replace the gift of fear in the protection pantheon. And in my opinion, he succeeded. And I, nothing against Alan and Gary, both of whom also have awesome books I've recommended all over the place. In fact, uh, my plan was to show all the books that our guests have written, but Alan, yours is on loan. And so I don't have yours with me. I have been thrusted upon a friend. Um, there it is. <laughs> but yes, absolutely. The Safety Trap is the best book I've read in the last, it's the best book I've read on personal safety. He set his mission to kind of take the ideas in the gift of fear and update it, you know, 20 years later. Uh, second question, best advice for a female college freshman moving into the dorms? Uh, make the right friends. And that, that's all there is to it. You know, community is the best form of self-defense. And when you meet the right people, the person across the hall who's going to listen if there's something going on in your room, the, you know, the person in the police cadet program who's one floor down, who can help you talk to the right people if there's a problem. Finding, creating that community early and effectively is gonna be your best safety measure, in my opinion. And we've got a couple experts who are gonna come in who can, we'll ask that question again, because I think that is really, there are people who know more about that than me because I am not, nor have I had a uh, freshman girl. I'm, I'm raising only sons. All right. What made me decide to launch my podcast? Uh, okay, so that's, that's a really, it's an interesting question to me. Tell me if it's boring to you. But the first notion for this was a book that I called Precious Cargo. 
where I took my travel experience and my experience as a parent and interviewed a number of uh, close protection specialists and bodyguards about applying bodyguard doctrine to family travel safety. Because until I started researching that book, I had not learned anything in my martial arts training about protecting a seven-year-old while you're in Bangkok. Uh, and from there, a number of, uh, number of agents thought that that was an interesting idea, but way, way, way too specialized. And they thought that what I should do instead is do a more broad approach. And so the podcast is a way of building a platform for that book when it comes out. And our various guests and our very, who've come on the show have been helping to show me even more of what I don't know. So that book's going to be infinitely better because of these interviews and than it would have been before that. Yeah. Oh, here's an interesting question. Uh, horrible cruise ship incident. How do you tell you or the people you're traveling with are too old or slow to corral a child? Okay, so there's two different ways of, of um, interpreting that question. One is, how can you tell if they are? And I'm not sure what uh, is a, I don't know what better advice to give than just to watch them in action and see if they're fast enough and fit enough. Pay attention to, don't have that cruise and for people who don't know, there was a situation where a child fell off the railing of a cruise ship because the grandparent who was watching them was not quick enough to get over there and stop them. But, you know, watch them in action. See, you know, don't make that incident the first time the adult is responsible for your child. And uh, pay attention. Uh, the second question, second way to interpret that is, how do you tell somebody that you deem them too old or too slow to care for your child? And that one's a lot harder. Damn it, Jim, I'm a martial arts instructor, not a family counselor. So I don't know that I'm gonna give you the right answer on that, but in my limited experience in human interaction, it's best to be as honest and compassionate as you can be. You know, I don't like the phrase brutal honesty because usually that's just somebody trying making an excuse to be brutal. But to sit down with somebody, if you care enough about them to have them watch your kid, you probably care about them and they probably know you care about them. And so to express that caring while at the same time saying, buddy, I need, you know, I need to have somebody else care for them. I'm concerned about that. And if you have that relationship, I mean, that might be an opportunity to transition that into a conversation about their health and fitness. You know, I've had a couple of friends who, as we've gotten older, have gotten dangerously overweight, where I've sat down with them and said, buddy, I want to be drinking beer with you 30 years from now. And at the rate you're going, that's, I'm not sure that's going to happen. So what, what can I do to help, you know, and that might be a way to transition into that. That is a very hard conversation to have. All right. So it is coming on to 510. So I want to introduce our first guest, Gary Quesenberry who is the author of Spotting Danger Before It Spots You, Spotting Danger Before It Spots Your Kids. And this is the fellow to talk to about situational awareness in particular, about taking care of your kids in particular. He's a federal air marshal, retired now, who's raised kids in that world. If you read his book, you'll find out about an uh, incident where those two worlds collided in terrifying ways that he... Uh, escape through a combination of good skill and blind luck. Uh, I'll save that story for anybody who buys the book because you should buy and read the book. Uh, so questions for Gary. Hello, Gary. Thank you so much for coming on. Hey, it's my pleasure. It's good to be here. Good to see you again. Absolutely. Now, Jenny, you had a question for him. Was it the college freshman question? Okay. So Jenny has a question. That wasn't my question, but that's an oh, excellent okay. question. Um, I wasn't sure if you still wanted me to chat or or just yeah, talk. Just talk and go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I do have um, children, women in their 20s. Um, 
one is living on her own in Florida, you know, thousands of miles away from me. The other one just bought her own home and will be living alone for the first time in her life. So what is like the single most important piece of advice you can give me to help them, you know, think about their safety? Well, the one thing that you have to do as a parent is just kind of understand what, what, you know, their circumstances are and where they're at and what they're doing in those circumstances. The, uh, the, the one thing I would say to tell them is to look at the data in the area where they are, look at police reports. There's plenty of websites and stuff that you can get on to look at crime rates in certain areas, get to know your neighbors, like we were discussing earlier, you know, the, the, the community is your best sense of safety. Uh, and then other than that, there's just little tips and tricks that you can tell them if they're both gonna be by themselves, you know, to, to kind of, kind of boost their, their own safety. One of the things I talk about in the book is uh, there was a guy who went to a prison and he interviewed uh, a, a serial rapist and asked him about what were some of the things that he looked for when he was breaking into these homes and taking advantage of these women. And he said that one thing he always stayed away from is if there was a dog in the house, even a small one, he wouldn't go anywhere near it. So a dog, you know, is always a good idea. He said, other than that, if there was a muddy pair of work boots or something like that on the front porch outside the door, and it looked like there could be some sort of a physical, you know, man living in that house that he didn't necessarily want to confront, then he would skip that house altogether. So just little things like that are, uh, are good ideas for girls who are striking out on their own for the first time, getting their own place. Thank you. I'm going to text her right now. <laughs> Here's another interesting um, question. Can, uh, can I add one to that? Uh, when you're walking around outside, take off your headphones, take out your earbuds. I cannot even count the number of women that I have walked next to who I'm not even trying to be sneaky and are, you know, just lost their music or just like, oh, I, I didn't see you coming. And I mean, it's broad daylight. I'm just walking generally at a pretty good clip. And they're just completely oblivious because they've turned off their, their sound receptors. Take out your headphones and pay attention. I could have been so much worse than just someone walking on the way to the train station. Now, Alan has a catchphrase associated with that. Yeah, I tell people, pull your head out of your apps, A-P-P-S and pay attention to what's going on around because so many people they're absorbed in their phone and i actually have watched people walk into each other two girls on a university they walked into each other because they're both on their phone and i you know they're like oh i'm sorry and i just had to sit there and just shake my head and, you know. yeah not to mention someone can run by and yoink right out of your hand then you're out 600 bucks so one yeah, of our uh, one of our guests, it might have been you, Gary, actually had does that to his kids. Yeah, I would do that whenever they were younger and they got their cell phones. Anytime we were out, we always had safe zones. So like if they were in their own room or something like that, I never messed with them. But if they were in one of the common areas, we're having a movie night or a game night and they couldn't put their phone down. If I caught them not paying attention, I just snatch it away from them. And then normally for them to get their phone back, they had to answer a series of uh, you know, like American history questions or something. <laughs> Just, you know. And eventually they learn, okay, dad's in the room. It's common area. I've got my phone, right? I talk about in the book that observable value, limit that amount of observable value, you know, to, to limit the amount of attraction you have to, you know, with predators. And it worked. You know, as soon as they saw me walk into a room, they put the phones away. <laughs> it reminds me of what uh, uh, DJ would do to you periodically, Jason. Yes. Yeah, my Living in a jujitsu household is a whole new uh, experience for alertness. Yeah. And my all... I, yes, a relationship very much like Kato and uh, Fuso for many years. Okay, so Gary, next question for you uh, from, from Chris. He's just moved to the city of Minneapolis, and he's curious about ways to recognize when public demonstrations might start cresting over to a riot. And that's really, you know, that's that's on point for folks in some American cities, but it's also a thing that is becoming more and more common worldwide, especially for right. traveling abroad. 
So do you have any thoughts on that kind of awareness? I, I certainly do. And, you know, I worked in a prison system for a long time before I became a federal air marshal. So, you know, we got some experience with things like that. The one thing I would tell him is just to, to one, like we said earlier, keep your head up, headphones out, you know, be engaged with your environment. And that's not something that you just flip a switch and it goes from demonstration to riot. You know, it, it, it doesn't happen that quickly. It, it, it may seem like it happens very quickly, but if you know what you're looking for, those little pre-incident indicators, you can see when things are starting to go south. And it usually happens in small groups and then spreads until it becomes all interconnected and now you're just in the middle of a giant riot. So look for those little cells of people who are obviously up to no good, veer away from those folks, try to stay in the peaceful areas. And if you see things getting bad there, then just, get out as soon as you can. And whenever you go into a situation like that, or you may be exposed to something like that, make sure that you know where the police are, where the exits are, you know, where, you know, you can get yourself to a safe place if you need to. If I might, um, this got brought home to me um, in a kind of a hu dangerous and humorous way last summer when we were not at a demonstration, but, uh, on the way past on the periphery and got confronted by some unpleasant people. And the thing that uh, de-escalated was one of them was standing there doing the woofing, th the woofing I'm dangerous thing. And this little gal, maybe four foot 10, just walked between us and was halfway down the block before he realized that she'd lifted his pistol and his knife. <laughs> he had, he, he had lots of toys, but he had no situational awareness, uh, thank goodness. Yeah. And on the topic of situational awareness, Gary, this is a good one coming from Amy. When you're teaching awareness, <coughs> especially with young women, how do you have that conversation without just scaring them? Well, I talk a lot about that in my second book, Spotting Danger Before It Spots Your Kids. You know, all too often back in, you know, like when, when I was a child, my parents tended to, you know, keep you away from dangerous situation by using fear. You know, the whole stranger danger thing, you know, that's not always the best option. You don't want anybody to be afraid. You want everybody to be engaged with their environment, to be friendly and active and uh, just stay aware of everything. So when it comes to talking to younger women about situational awareness without scaring them, you got to teach them about what predators look for, right? You got to teach them to stay engaged with their environment. And then once they have those things nailed down, then you can just start working with them on those little basic games that we talked about earlier that keep them engaged with their environment whenever they're out and about. And that just helps to maintain that situational awareness or at least the perception of situational awareness, because believe it or not, that matters. Like, uh, you know, the Grayson and Stein study back in 1981, where they determine that your posture, your body language, all that has almost everything to do with how predators view you. And if they view you as timid and weak, then you're more likely to be targeted. So just keep that situational awareness level up and keep them engaged, always engaged. Yeah, what's interesting is I have had neck injuries and uh, like upper back pain. And the way that I have found to prevent it is uh, holding my neck up straight and my shoulders back to try and make everything erect. And the thing that that does is it also sends a very clear nonverbal yeah. message of confidence and strength. Mm -hmm. And it, it's like an anti-asshole field. I don't even get cat called, it's the silliest thing. But uh, just, you know, the walking around, you know, erect, looking around, keeping a alert instead of this. Yeah. Uh, can actually prevent a lot of problems. Well, that posture is one of the things the, the Grayson and Stein study that Gary mentioned specifically calls that out as one of the traits that the bad guys just tend to steer away from. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that stuff, that stuff even goes back to the, uh, the first studies I saw on this were in the early 70s, where it was um, just silent, um, silent films of people walking and um, and uh, violent felons um, looking at the films and just saying, 
uh, go, no go as a victim. Um, posture, eye contact, um, coordination and gait uh, were all the, th were, regardless of strength, age, apparent health, were the things that they cued in on. Yeah. And uh, Gary goes into that in some detail in this book as well. So uh, Don is on deck. Gary, I want to thank you so much for coming on. I do have one last question before we go. No problem. I'm not going to ask you if anybody's asked you this before, but I'm going to ask how many have pointed out your marked resemblance to Alton Brown. I don't know who that is. <laughs> He's the host of a cooking show. Quick we have to fix question. that. How many people have asked how you stuck those paintings to your ceiling wall thing <laughs> behind you? <laughs> those, I picked those up in different cities when I was a federal air marshal. So I finally had them framed and hung up, but I've just got this slanted wall. They're screwed into those studs. Uh, I was okay. thinking he looked like Matt Damon. Oh, there you go. Oh, He'll wow. Take that for sure. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Gary. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Coming on next is Don Armstrong, the founder, CEO, and general head honcho of Think Safe Seminars, where she teaches awareness drills, self defense drills, um, empowerment to men and women in the workplace and at home. Hello, Don. Hello, Jason. Hello, everybody. Yeah. In, in addition to situational awareness, today I was actually teaching part two of a non-escalation and de-escalation class to a group of seniors. I saw somebody was asking about seniors and how they can stay healthy and how they can stay safe. And a lot of that ties into the workplace question that Jenny asked as well. And a lot of it, you know, is prevention and managing the conflict in a way to keep it from escalating, um, using some different strategies to be able to bring that situation back onto uh, a level where you can talk again, where it's not a crisis situation, where you're out of physical danger. So, yeah. It seems interesting that uh when we start talking about senior senior safety, especially, <coughs> to look at an assault, and there's the pre-incident indicators that Gary mentioned that you can see the trouble coming, and your first line of defense is admitting that that is trouble and that it is coming, and not putting blinders on and hoping it ain't so, uh, for our own health, um, as we age, that the same thing applies, that maybe I should eat fewer cheeseburgers. You see that danger coming, but you put the blinders on and go through McDonald's drive through anyway. Uh, you know, you said we need to jog and stretch, do our Tai Chi, whatever it is, and stave off that danger. But what are you taught us senior safety class today? And some folks have asked questions. What are some of the most important things we can encourage our elders to do to stay safe as they start losing that strength and coordination? As they start losing strength and coordination, well, Exercising. Exercising is helpful for so many reasons throughout your life, but even as a senior, just staying fit, right? And being able to keep walking, keep being able to move. And that helps with that body language that you guys were talking about before, being able to present yourself confidently and walk with purpose and keeping your head up, looking around. But with the seniors, a lot of the time they're, they're interested in things like the non-escalation and de-escalation. What are the signs to look for when you, you see something up ahead, you're not quite sure what's going on. How do you evaluate that situation? What is your threat assessment? You know, what are the specific things that you can look for um, as far as like the person's hand movements or where they're looking or how they're acting. Are they just looking around like they're waiting for somebody? Are they looking directly at different people? How are they presenting themselves? And are you getting that feeling? Are you getting that feeling in your gut? Like, hmm, I don't know, something is not right about this. And, you know, you always have to 
trust your gut and have an out. Know how to walk around a different way. You have to walk an extra half a block. That's okay. It's just extra, extra exercise. <laughs> but there are a lot of different ways to uh, manage the conflict or potential conflict without es escalating it. So Brahm asked a question about that with that escalation. So let's let's imagine a, a social interaction or a workplace situation where there's somebody and you know from their body language, from past behavior or something that any interaction will result in escalation. They're spoiling for a fight and they've laid down a verbal trap and whatever you say, they're gonna take that as an excuse to get angrier. Um, what are some of the best ways to diffuse that situation? So they're pushing your buttons or they're obviously um, easily triggered, right? Redirections are helpful. And redirecting, try to infuse a little more if possible, get it back on track, stay focused on the work and don't make it personal. Those would be some suggestions. Often somebody who's that angry is very similar to somebody who's drunk. And the guy who taught me to bounce had a little catchphrase about how you can't reason with a drunk, but they're pretty easy to confuse. <laughs> I worked and, at a bars as well, yeah. <laughs> and, then, uh, and Chris asks, talk a little more about redirection. What is redirection? What is redirection? Redirection is when you interrupt the thought process. Right. So say somebody is mad about whatever they're they're angry and they're yelling or they've they've got this one track that they're following. Right. And if you can interrupt that even for a moment, like just redirect their attention away from that thought process, like Oh my God, did you see that game last night? What, that guy was awesome. The way he hit the ball. And, oh wait, you didn't see the game? Oh, okay. Well, and you can revert back to the topic, but in a less aggressive way and hopefully calm him down. Or you see people redirect a lot on uh, TV shows, especially political talk shows. Somebody gets asked a question and they don't really want to answer it. They, they skip to a different subject. That's a redirection. Okay. Yeah, one of those classic examples, if you're sitting in a bar zoning out and some guy's like, hey, what are you staring at? Because you just happen to be looking in the direction they're sitting. You just can't tilt your head. Dave from Central High School? Is that you, man? And then it's, it's off the races and everything's fine. Right. That's another that's another example. Rhonda, you ask a great question and just the person to answer it's coming on in a bit. So I'm going to save that one. Uh, it looks like we have about one more uh, time for one more question from Don and talking again about seniors who you worked with today. If it comes to a self-defense scenario. And Jenny Coakley also asks about people with disabilities. And I think some of these answers will be the same. What's what's your best chance, you know, when you are getting a little older, when you don't have the movement and the strength that you did in your 30s and 40s and 50s and even 60s? What are there things that you can do to keep yourself safe, even with those disadvantages? To keep yourself safe prior to being attacked or if you are in, being in the, in the attack, you know, in the attack. Best, yeah. What's your best? What's your best bet? Um. Claws, hands, going at the face, going at the eyes, um, elbows. Elbows are strong no matter what your age. Um, and elbows can work in a lot of different directions, right? Uh, but your your hands go for the eyes. Um, your voice, your voice can be a weapon. And your voice, if 
everybody probably knows what I mean when I say the mom voice, right? Like you pushed and you've pushed and you've pushed and you finally crossed that line and enough, enough. Everybody knows that voice. Everybody responds to that voice, right? Whether you're mom, dad, grandparent, whatever. The point is if people will respond with certain tones. And so it's a combination of things, right? And you just use your voice, draw attention to the situation. Hopefully you can draw some help. Um, and yeah, scratch their eyes, get them in the face, try to just get them to let go even for a moment so you can try to get away. I had a woman in a class last week who asked a question uh, because she uses a walker. And she said, you know, I don't go out a lot at night. I'm usually pretty aware, I'm looking around. And, but what do I do if somebody approaches me and, you know, I'm using my walker? And I was like, well, a, lot, a walker is a lot like a shopping cart. And they're great tools to put between you and that other person, okay? And keep them away ram it into them sh their shins i mean you can use that as as a weapon and to create some distance between you and the other person so. and that the mom voice even if the attack is not responding i don't know many people who if they heard a senior or elder or disabled person using that voice would not immediately kind of meerkat around see what's going on and say not on my watch if they saw that senior disabled person being as hacked. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Don, so much for coming on. I uh, appreciate it again. She's, she runs Think Safe Seminars. Uh, they operate in Tucson, but she does distance learning nationwide, worldwide, most likely. So thank you again. And with us next is Teja Van Wicklin, who is an amazing martial artist and who runs Get Offensive, which is my favorite name for a uh, self-defense uh, organization. And Teja, Teja and I both have very similar experiences in terms of our training, but we've nerded out a little bit on the difference between somebody her size, what works for somebody her size doing self-defense and somebody my size doing self-defense and how they're very different worlds. So I think I'll, I'll take one of those questions again and repeat it to you, Teja, about if you are smaller or if you are older or if you have a disability, what are some of the things that you can best do to protect yourself against a um, larger, stronger, more mobile attacker? Hi, Jason. Thanks. It's really, it's really, I love what you're doing. Um, and you have great people on, so it's really cool. I'm glad you're out there. Including um, you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I'll, I'm going to kind of stop and go back a little bit to the beginning of that question, which is when you're talking about a situation where the differential is really huge and you've got someone small or infirm or older against someone who's much bigger, then there are a couple of questions that you wanna ask first. So one is how determined is the attacker? Because an attacker who's gone, who's kind of just wandering around and goes, oh, look, there's a good target. It's, a, it's an opportunity, right? It's just a, it's a momentary, um, it's just a moment, right, in time. Oh, look, I'll just grab her purse or something. And you appear to be ready to fight, that may be all you need. And he may just be like, you know what? You can throw something at me, push me away, yell really loudly, scream, appear to be aggressive in some way or willing to fight. And they may go, you know what? This is just too much trouble. I'm out of here. I'll find somebody else who's easier. I don't want to get scratched. I don't want to get hurt. They're making too much noise. I'm gonna get caught, right? Because attackers, what? They don't wanna get hurt. They don't wanna get caught, just like we do. Unless, you know, one that one in a million, you get the one in a million crazy guy who doesn't care what happens to him, but you can't plan for that guy. And that's really rare, right? So how determined is your attacker? If he's someone who knows you or who's been watching you from across the street or the bagel store you go to, and he's a stalker or he's someone who's invested in you, then it's a very different situation. And you need to have a plan beforehand for anything like that, because if you're infirm or if you're smaller, you're gonna to have to fight harder and there aren't any specific tools. 
it's really every tool you've got at the same time. So you're going to do everything if somebody corners you or tries to move you to another place, which we know is an absolute no-no, then you're gonna throw everything at them. You're going to scream and yell and growl and bite and claw and kick and scratch like a wild animal to keep this from happening to you, right? Unless you can get away and you always get away if you can get away. If you can get away, get out of the way. It's always easier to, I say, it's better to stay out of trouble than to have to get out of trouble. Would you rather swerve away from a car accident or would you rather be in a car accident, you know, and get out of it well, right? Which one would you prefer? So I don't know, that's, is that too much of an answer? <laughs> That's a fantastic answer. Uh, could you could you go a little deeper? You mentioned about never go with the bad guys. And this is something that people who work in security and safety know that no matter what they threaten you with, you do not want to go from where the bad guy finds you to where the bad guy wants you. But right. that that is uh, people going with them is a staple in TV, in movies. Uh, you often see people, I've seen newscasters give the advice to get in the car with somebody who points a gun at you and get in the car, which they should not do. Could, can I, you talk a little bit about why going to crime scene number two is a terrible idea? Thank goodness I've never heard that from anybody because I would have called the station <laughs> and raised hell. Um, it, well, I mean, it's you're basically beginning with the end in mind right so you jump to where this guy wants to take you and there's no reason for him to want to take you away from any place that he finds you he can do whatever he needs to there if he wants something from you if he's taking you somewhere then he's most likely what's the kind of you're gonna tell me jason what 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 kind of guy is this that is a uh, process predator <laughs> right he's a process predator so the guy who's who's a process predator is the guy who wants to play with you. He likes to play with his food. And that's a really awful way to put it, but that's what it is. He has a different plan. So if he's moving you, it's so you can't make noise. It's so he can do whatever he wants. And that is a place you don't want to go. If you're going to die, you want to die there. Um, and throw everything you have at him right then and there. Because if he wants to take you in a car, put you somewhere, it's, it's, it's going to be worse than what you have in front of you. Take it now. If, you know, if he's got a gun on you, stick your finger in the gun. I don't care what you do. Don't go with it. Right. Run. Most people are terrible shots. He may not hit you in a, in a, in a vital area. Scream really loudly and run as fast as you can. Push the gun out of his hand. If you don't have skills, do everything, throw everything you can at him. Do not go with him. And even if he does shoot you, his next move is most likely going to be to get the hell out of there meaning that you are that much closer to medical attention than if he shoots you at his leisure wherever he wanted to take you. Really important point. Yeah, really important point. And then yeah. also, if he shoots and kills you, it was much quicker than he had in mind. Right. So, so, many, so many reasons why this... All, all around, the odds are better and, the, and the, the options are better where you are than going somewhere else as a general rule. I mean, I'm sure there's some crazy scenario we haven't considered, but as a general rule, that's definitely a good... A better plan. Um, I want to repeat a question from earlier because I'd love your insights on it. Uh, we have a viewer who's got a college freshman going off into the dorms to be away from mom's protective embrace. What is the best advice you can give to female college freshmen moving out into the dorms on the college campuses? Study psychology. <laughs> Read some books on psychology on what people Probably my best advice is a really simple bit, and you'll you'll read a lot about it in a book like The Gift of Fear, which is that charm is not. Um, what does he What does he say? Charm is not. Charm is a tool, not a personality trait, right? So if someone's being charming, they likely want something. Being nice, being a good person, is not the same as being charming. So a really good way to get something out of, in fact, a better way to get something out of somebody then saying, listen, if you don't do this for me, I'll kill you, is, hey, you have such beautiful eyes. You know, hey, are, are you, don't you know so-and-so? I mean, you can, names are names, right? Don't you know Anne? Well, there are a thousand Anne's, right? Um, start a conversation, uh, find things you have in common, be really charming, right? So study, ch especially charm of all things, how people are charming, study psychology and how that works, because the things that are going to get you in college are not people jumping out of the bushes. They're people preying on you at parties or in class and getting you into a position 
that is optimal for them. And the way they do that is generally with psychology. And predators are really good at this. They know what works and they know how to talk to you and they know how to charm you and how to tell you you're really smart. And young girls in college are notoriously low in confidence. Even the smartest ones and the prettiest ones have really low confidence. And you can, and a good smart talker can get them into any position at any time if they don't understand ahead of time how that works. And that is, it's not physical. It's not about punching and kicking. Absolutely not. It's about going, you know what? You're full of crap. I'm not talking to you anymore. Or yeah, that's interesting. I got to go to the bathroom. I'll be back in a bit. Don't come back. <laughs> right. That kind of stuff. Uh, one of the best ways I ever heard it phrase is that charm is not an adjective. It's a verb. Right. And yeah. Why are the if I, if I yeah. may, thank yeah. you. So thank you so much. This is when we taught self-defense in colleges many well, these many years ago, that was the one lesson that was hardest to get across. And in some ways, the only one that's the only one that really made a difference for them. Just because he knows your name and just because you've been on a date together does not mean that he's not still, uh, that, that he doesn't want to eat you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well said. And, and all that all that stranger danger about, uh, you know, about around your house and the, the burglar breaking in, that's not statistically, that's not the real threat. The real threat is the person who knows your name. Yeah. Yeah. It's the good looking guy or the good looking woman who just, who, who just, you know, is interested in you. And you're like, so, oh my God, the, the, the head of the foot, the, you know, the, the captain of the football team likes me. No, he likes the fact that you're shy and timid and you're going to be easy to that may be the worst possible place to lose audio. Yeah. <laughs> Uh oh. Oh no. Oh no. But when we're coming Oops, in, what happened? Oh, we lost you. Hello? We lost your audio there for a bit. Uh the sentence literally yeah. ended with he knows you'll be easy. Can you hear uh, me? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Can yeah, you're back. <laughs> oh, no. Well, that too. <laughs> Am I back? Okay. I'll just move closer to the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, Tesha, thank you so much for your insights today. Uh, find her at her website, Get Offensive. And uh, she is she is one of the top thinkers operating in self-defense, especially in women's self-defense today. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. And Thanks, Jason. Yeah. You're awesome. Jason, Jason, I got to interrupt because yeah. um, <clears throat> to know her website, we need to know what the website is. Getoffensive.com, yeah? Thank you. Yes. Yes. And I will be posting links to everybody in the show notes when this goes up on YouTube. And next up is Alan Burris, who has patiently been with us the whole time. Alan wrote the book, Survive a Shooting, which, as I said earlier, my copy is on loan, but he's got one right there to show it to us. And his episode was on how to survive a mass violence situation. But Alan's experience goes well beyond that. Oh, good. I was afraid he might be a one-trick pony. <laughs> but uh, let's let's go ahead and uh, go back. We had that question for Gary earlier about being in a civil unrest burgeoning onto a riot situations. I imagine you have some experience and some thoughts on that. So why don't we go ahead and start there? Certainly. And I want to say thanks for having me on, Jason. And I won't stay for the whole show because after this, I'm going to have to get off and I got to go teach tonight. But Excellent. everybody's comments and have been a great to be part of you know first and foremost you know i tell people you know if you got a group like that that could get violent you know why are you at that group you know a lot of people are just looky lookers oh you know and and just leave go someplace safe i mean that's always going to be the best bet is just avoid places that potentially could get violent but you know if you're at a peaceful thing you know, you're just watching people. Are people starting to get excited? Do you have somebody that's sort of getting loud and vocal and, and, and you know, 
pushing some boundaries, maybe getting into it with officials, whether the law enforcement officials or somebody else, security or something. You see people start acting up like that. Your best bet is to leave. If things get really bad and you're caught in the middle of it, you know, now you're, now you're in survival mode, you know, and you're sitting there trying to get out of a crowd. And, you know, and maybe, you know, boom, a, you know, a bomb or something went off and now you got the whole crowd going one way, you know, stay on your feet. Don't get trampled. You know, one of the worst injuries is if you go down and a mob tramples you. So you want, if you can, you get to sides where a wall or something where you can go along the wall. You're not out in the middle getting trampled. If you got kids or something with you, you know, why did you have them there in the first place? It could get violent or something, but you got to make sure you keep them close. And so you're grabbing hands, holding hands, keeping them, guiding them. So, you know, I, I've written articles on this. And again, it just depends on the situation. But first and foremost, if anything, if you have any little feeling that things could go sideways, leave. I mean, and, and that's appropriate with any kind of violence. I mean, Gavin DeBecker wrote about it years ago. Pay attention to that intuition. If something looks like it's just not right and it could go violent or it's, it could go bad, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or it's you know, a huge group, listen to those feelings and get yourself to safety. Uh, Todd Elder put in the chat, if you feel a need to, to take a gun, if you want to go to go to that particular bar, don't go to that bar. Exactly. Go to a different bar. Uh, so another question, uh, getting into the book, the, uh, the say, survivor shooting, Alan teaches schools and other organizations and institutions ways to prepare for that kind of mass violence. Uh, one question I have is, I have very little confidence that my school district has a plan. Who do I call to find out if they have a plan? And if they don't have a plan that I approve of, how do I annoy them until dealing with me is more annoying than going ahead and putting a plan in place? Well, when you're talking to schools, there may be a safety officer. There may be an SRO. There's obviously the superintendent. And then there's members of the school board. All of those people have a vested interest in the school safety. Which one would be the best to talk to is going to be determined by the individuals. You know, I know a school here, the superintendent was the person to talk to. And he's very into, I'm going to make this school super safe. Um, a principal sometimes. You know, I was down in Arizona a few years ago. I was talking to a a conference for one school's organization, but one of the people there said, I want you to talk to the principal of the school where my kids go to. And it was a charter school, went over and talked to that principal. She asked her safety guy to come in and half an hour later, they're like, when can you come down? I mean, they just get it and they were proactive. And when I went back down there to teach that uh, active shooter response and the reflex protect user class, she made every employee go to that class. And after, and I didn't know that until afterwards when a lady came up to me and said, well, thank you. I, I learned a lot. This was great. And she left and the principal said, I'm really glad to hear that because she didn't want to go. Uh -huh. she was trying to get out of going but I said, no, it's 100% mandatory, everybody attend. And so some people, whether it's a principal, a superintendent or somebody else, they get it and they can be very proactive. So you need to find the person at your school who is that person. And it may be a school board member, it may be an SRO or the safety coordinator, it might be the principal or superintendent. And once you get them on your side, they help get everybody else involved to make it happen. Excellent. Uh, before I go on to my next question, does anybody else have any questions for Alan about this topic? I know it's in the news a lot. We had something go up down in Austin just this week. Uh, I don't want to take. I don't want to ask, ask all the questions, although I got I got some on deck yet. Yeah, unfortunately, right. it's back in the news again. You yeah, know, we sort of had a a lull, which was nice. You know, people weren't killing each other during the pandemic, 
sadly people are dying from other reasons but now it seems people are wanting to kill each other a little bit more at least it's yeah. up in the news um i'd like to close out with a in your book you make a case against run fight hide which is kind of the the theme song or whatever if you will of a, surviving some kind of active shooter situation but you you choose different words for very specific and I think intelligent reasons. Could you share that with us a little bit? Sure. I mean, run, hide, fight is known. And I think words are powerful. And so I changed the terminology and put them in a triangle for my book. The first one being escape, because it might not be running. It might be dropping to the ground and crawling away. It might be going out a window, but I want you to escape the danger zone, not just run blindly because they told me to run. The next is deny. Instead, I hate the word hide because hiding and hoping is not a strategic plan for survival. I like deny because it's proactive and you are denying the killer access to harm you. That might be hiding because if he doesn't see you, he might not do something. But it also is barricading, locking doors, barricading, keeping the person away from you, getting behind something that's bulletproof so he can't hurt you. If it's a knife wielder, not a gun person, it's getting something between you to deny him access, whether it's a chair or a desk, but you're proactively doing things to deny that killer access to you. And then instead of, and, and fight is okay, but I use sometimes defend yourself because some people, they don't wanna go fight, they're not fighters. Well, you're defending yourself. And when you do defend yourself, you attack back. You have to go offensively like, you know, the person on before, you know, I loved her, her title of her school too, because offensive is what's going to stop the person. And so you attack back and stop that killer from hurting you or anybody else. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on today, Alan. I really appreciate it. Uh, tell us a few of the websites you can be found at. Surviveashooting.com about the book. Or Reflex Protect is where I do all my training out of and different classes on de-escalation, Reflex Protect user, which is a defensive spray, or the survival shooting classes are done under reflexprotect.com too. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Alan. Thank uh, you, Jason. Everybody look him up. And coming up next is Sifu Dave Kovar, uh, one of my personal heroes, a man who's been teaching martial arts for far longer than I've been alive, who is the author of this and what is, you got about a half a dozen books out now, don't you, sir? Yes, sir, a few, yes. Excellent. And Dave was on to talk about bullying. And a question just came up about bullying among adults that I'd love to start asking about. And that was the rise of this Karen Kevin persona seems to have changed the way some people deal with conflict, especially in social situations with people they don't know. How can adults deal with that kind of uh, bullying that seems to be on the rise? So first off, Jason, I love what you're doing, man. Thanks for having me on the show. And I just love listening to the speakers. I'm such a big fan of Gavin De DeBecker and I've taken so much of what I've learned from him uh, and, and applied it to everything that we do in, in our schools. And our, our core thing we do is of course, teach martial arts that's at the core, but martial arts and self-defense are so different. And we've tried to integrate real world, you know, self-defense and safety into our program. And, and so for kids, uh, we follow a rule. And I, I think this is, applies for adults as well, what we call the five rules of personal safety. And, and they're, they're really rule number one. And, and none of these, all stuff, following all these steps, regardless of your age, is not going to guarantee you're never going to be in a conflict. It just stacks the odds in favor, right? Uh, like the, what's important, I think, for people to know is the majority of the people uh, are going to go through their life. Whatever's happened in the past are going to go through their life. And if they if they're aware and, uh, of what's going on, chances are going to live the rest of their life and not be in a violent confrontation. However, there's a certain uh, that violence is out there. And, and if we follow these rules, we're less likely to be exposed to it. And the rule number one is to create safe habits. And the whole idea is to analyze your day from dawn to dusk and just think, all right, man, you know, how many how many times have I uh, and I'll get your question second, Jason. I just wanted to kind of go through the basics. Have I uh, like maybe gotten gas at a time, a day, a day and time when I knew I should have gotten it earlier because I'm in a part of town I don't really know, and but I have no choice because I'm almost empty. 
right? So a crate safe hat would be always have a rule when you get gas when no lower than, a, a, you know, three eighths of a tank or something along that lines, right? Uh, how many times have I gone to the ATM when I'm thinking, ah, oh, I should have gone earlier today, uh, you know? And so that's create safe habits is analyze your day from dawn to dusk and think, you know, uh, where where am I exposed? And, you know, Alan, you said something about, you know, don't, if you have to take a bar or someone had commented, uh, oh, Todd said, hey, if you have to take a gun into a bar, then don't go to that bar. I can tell you a story. About 30 years ago, I had this guy that comes into my martial arts school and he's got a, you know, a, a cut stitches on his lip and a black guy and he's clearly just been in the in a bar fight and and i go yeah can i help you he goes yeah i i, I want to learn to defend myself i go what's going on he goes well every time i go to this one bar i get in a fight and i jokingly said don't go to that bar and he goes i never thought of that so metaphor <laughs> metaphorically speaking what bars are you going into you know what i'm saying so that's step number one is to create safe habits okay and step number two is, is be aware, but not on guard. We know that being paranoid, as Gavin DeBecker says, true fear is a gift, unwarranted fear is a curse. Know the difference, right? And so if we walk around afraid of everything, our instincts aren't gonna be able to operate correctly for us. And so when something is really bad, we're not gonna know the difference because we're gonna be afraid of everything. At the flip side, I kind of look at it like a defensive driver. You know, if you, if the last time you guys drove, chances are you got to your destination safely. And why? Because you were following the rules of the road. You were doing something close to the speed limit. Hopefully you're using your blinker, you know, all those kind of things. And, and you know, if something's gonna happen, you, you're gonna be able to react. Well, it's kind of like when you live your life, if, if I was driving and I was being really reckless, I increased the odds of me getting in an accident. At the same time, if I'm so paranoid about, you know, driving and I'm just doing boom that doesn't make me a better driver that makes me more our reactions not to go as well so that's the step number two is to be aware but not on guard and step number three is trust your intuition okay and and uh and with that of course we've all had a time when we've successfully been able to avoid a conflict because we saw what was going on an example was my 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 mom years ago was about 80 years old and a uh, the pest control guy came to the door and uh, it was a different guy than normal and she said, hey, we have some ants in the master bedroom. Could you take care of them? And uh, she said, as soon as, he, as she said that, the guy gave her this really weird, creepy look, came in the, in the door in the house and locked the door behind him. My, mo my mom's you know, heart started pumping and she's thinking, what do I do? She, she said, okay. She directed him down the hall and she walked out the garage door, got a neighbor. You can't call the cops over that, right? And, so, and she pretended to sweep the walk until the guy left. And then, of course, they called the service and discontinued. But here's the question. Did this guy have poor intentions in mind? Maybe not. Maybe he, he gave her a weird look because he had a busy schedule. And maybe he locked the door behind her because, because it's a door just like that at home, and that's his habit. We'll never know, and that's okay. So the phrase is, if in doubt, get out, right? And, so, and that's what we do by trusting your intuition. So back to your question, Jason, I think it's about one of the key things, bullying of all ages is, is prophylactics versus therapeutics. What I mean by that is projecting confidence to the best of your ability. OK, and that is, is the, the, ever, the average predator. And it doesn't matter if it's a kindergarten predator or it's the guy in the back alley waiting to jump somebody. OK, what they're looking for is prey. Think about this. If any of us right now were uh, we're told you have to the only way you can eat dinner tonight and feed your families, you have to fight somebody, pick whoever you want to fight. What are you going to do? You're going to find you're not going to go. Let me find the biggest, toughest, strongest guy in the around and let me fight him. No, you're going to you're going to pick someone you can get over on. And that's what the predators do. In most cases, they're recidivists. They're looking for someone they can get over on. And it's imagine that we all have uh, antennas or signals that say I'm weak, I'm I'm weak, I'm a victim, I'm an easy mark. Well, the predator has got their radio frequency tuned in. And if there's a match, boop, if they, all of a sudden there's a match. But I believe it was Sanford Strong that I heard this quote, the average bad guy, the average predator does not have an alternative plan. They have an alternative victim. And if we simply can present, project ourselves in confidence, look some in the eye, make sure our tonality is clear, uh, project a, a strong, confident voice, then that dramatically decreases the, the chance of us being bullied at any age. That was a very long answer to a short question. <laughs> It's a good answer. Thank you, sir. And second question related is what's advice for a kid when the bully lives in their own home, whether that's a sibling or also I'd like to to uh, expand that into uh, if you're an adult and that bully is an abusive spouse. What are what are some things we can do with that? 
Well, man, you just you just go with the easy ones right out of the gate, don't you? <laughs> right. Uh, well, here would be my my comment would be this: is that we teach kids there's a difference between tattling and reporting. Okay. If you ask a kid, uh, you know, uh, you know what's tattling? They say trying to get my friend in trouble. What's reporting? Reporting is is telling someone what's going on when it's not the right thing, whether it be for you or anyone else. And so that would apply in all ages, okay? Uh, you know, we have a call, concept called no secrets, okay? And that is, is that, and so for a kid, clearly, if they've got a sibling that's bullying them, bullying them, you know, there was a time when maybe some parents might have said, ah, suck it up, kid. You know, I got bullied by my big brother too. But but I, I think in, in, in my maybe my opinion, I think that's less and less of that. I think parents are more receptive in, to this. So the first thing that, that we as parents need to do is make sure that kids are comfortable in, in, in sharing with us without worrying, without having to worry about being defensive or, 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 or looked down upon, okay? So that kids are, are feel comfortable in talking with us. And as far as with the domestic violence, that's a real tricky one. Uh, and, and I don't know that I'm from my, you know, that, 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 that would be my field of expertise, except to say that hopefully as a society, I would hope that the people in my circle would know that if they're having challenges, that they, they have a friend and confidant which they can reach out to. Sure. I want to piggyback on that a little. One of, uh, just one of the watchers on the show mentioned a line, he doesn't remember where he got it. So I'm going to share it both because it's wonderful. And also if somebody can figure out who said this first, I'd love to find out. But in this family, we don't have secrets, but we do have surprises. A surprise is like what daddy's getting for Father's Day. And the point of a surprise is you delay telling it so that people can enjoy finding out about it more. Love it. Love it. Whereas That's a keeper. secret is something that you keep forever. That's and a that keeper. little That's dichotomy. Great. Yeah. And I, I wish I knew who came up with it originally because it's genius. Yeah. And I think that the discussion with bullying versus strangers is so important because, you know, as a martial arts instructor, a lot of times parents, especially parents of young kids are worried, man, I'm worried about my child being abducted. And the reality is uh, the chance of your child being abducted by a stranger is, is, is slim to none and slim left town. It's probably not going to happen. The person you have to worry about is, is as Alan had mentioned, the people in your circle. You know, that's, you know, the, the people in your circle, that, that's where we, uh, uh, you know, we have to teach our kids to be able to trust their intuition and not to have there be secrets. And, and, uh, 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 and, and you know, kids learn from experience. We all learn from experience. And one of the things that I think is super important is it's one thing to intellectualize it. It's another team to act it out. What I mean by that is, you know, I'm a big fan of role playing. Uh, like, for example, when my kids were little, you know, stranger, if someone came into the house, you know, what would you do? What's your exit strategy? Well, it's the same drill as if you had a fire drill. If you're stuck in this room, what are you going to do? Well, all right, I'm stuck. I'm going to I'm going to take my chair. I'm going to throw it through this uh, the, the window, and then I'm going to take my blanket and put it over this, and I'm going to exit over the uh, out the out the window, and I'm going to go to my next door neighbor at Jane's house, and that's going to be the same thing regardless of what happens. In other words, and then you practice that and you prepare them, and and, uh, and so the same with the thing would uh, apply whether it be fire or you know home invasion or anything like that. Outstanding. Well, thank you so much, Sipu, for coming on today. Really appreciate it. Uh, tell some folks about some websites where they can find your, find you and your wisdom. So I have a, a, a podcast called The Satori Lifestyle, where we talk about uh, health, fitness, self-defense, and you can play, get it wherever uh, you can find podcasts. And uh, uh, you can also go to uh, uh, donewithbullying.com is our website uh, for that, that we have a free program. We, we give to everyone in the world right now. We have about 1500 uh, uh, facilities throughout the United, the world that you utilize it, where we uh, discuss uh, not just what to do if you're being bullied, but uh, what to do if you see someone else being bullied, why you don't want to bully and a concept we call buddying is the, uh, the opposite of bullying. And the idea is to connect uh, strength and kindness go hand in hand. So that's a whole program that we we uh, that we offer that people can get free of charge if they go to the web, that website. Thank you again. Now next up is Andy Murphy, the Secure Dad. I can't see my. There I am, author of Home Security: The Secure Dad's Guide, host of the Secure Dad podcast. Andy has a. Uh, he's been in this in this podcasting safety business a little longer than I have and has been very generous with his mentorship and his help and extending the coming on today. Andy, thank you so much for joining us. 
Hey man, uh, thank you for for having me, and congratulations on a hundred episodes, man. This is this is a big milestone for you. Take this moment, soak it up, and enjoy it. And like having all these other awesome people here to support you in your one hundredth episode just speaks to how you are killing it, man. Congratulations. Well, thank you, man. I really appreciate that. I'm, I'm going to circle back to a question from earlier, and I'd love your point on it. Your book is very much about taking a, making your home safer. Mm -hmm. And one of our viewers is sending her daughter off to college far away. Uh, do you have any thoughts about how to make a dorm room safer? Um, really, it, it depends on, you know, first, you know, when parents get that list of things that they can and can't do to a dorm room, it's like you can't put nails in the wall, you can't do this, you can't do that, all that sort of stuff. I would call, I would tell parents, do what you think you can do. If you have to pay $200 at the end of the semester because you put a nail in the wall, hey, no big deal. The, uh, the security of your child is more important than any of the, that other kind of stuff. So I wouldn't really worry about uh, making sure that you, you, you kind of follow all the rules there. If you break one, it's no big deal. Um, what I would do is first of all, you know, it, did you say her, her daughter was going off? Not a son, mm -hmm. a daughter. I would um, at, at that age, I think everybody here knows that uh, freshman girls probably are targeted a little bit more often because they are new to the area, they're new to the college, they're new uh, to whatever is going on. So I would tell her first to go ahead and establish strong boundaries for whoever she chooses to interact with and make sure that she's following her intuition so that she doesn't invite somebody into her dorm room that is going to be a problem. You know, I'm one of these people that's not necessarily um, the only home security thing you ever need to do is get a is get a big dog and that's it. I, I want to make it proactive. I want to get outside the actual space. If she's having a problem inside of her dorm room, things have gone wrong before she got to that point. So I would really tell her to talk about or, and really coach her up on, you know, what are her physical and verbal boundaries? I learned a lot from Randy King recently. I just had him on my show and he talked about boundaries and really expanded uh, my understanding of, of what that is and how important those are to self-defense and to safety. So the first thing is I would tell her to really uh, weed out who she invites in. Now, obviously, if she's got some crazy roommate who has people coming in and out doing all sorts of stuff, we've all had that person. Um, at that point, I would tell her if she has a deadbolt uh, on her own personal room or at the room that she shares, that's a good thing to do. Also, if she's worried about somebody coming in or, you know, the drunk girl down the hall who, you know, mistakes her room for, for, for the other persons, um, the little travel safety locks that you see on Amazon for like 12 bucks, uh, they're, they're little red handled things and they slip in with the tongue of the door of the, of the twist knob. Those actually work. Uh, I have used them on hotel rooms and all sorts of stuff. If you feel like you need to go out and buy something, uh, for your kid as they're going off to college to protect their dorm room. Uh, definitely one of those. And I would also suggest pepper gel to carry in her purse because you never know what's going to go on if she's leaving the library late at night or, you know, here, here of late, anything happening in broad daylight, a protest gets out of hand, you never know. So those few things right there, uh, she'll be ahead of the game. Standing. Uh, this question is from Amy Rivers. Uh, do TV shows like It Takes a Thief help or hurt in terms of helping folks to understand home safety? You know, I actually really liked that show. Um, it's also because I, I love this space. <laughs> I love uh, what we're talking about. I geek out about it. This is what I do. Uh, I like it. Some of the stuff on the show, because I've, I've worked on TV shows before, and some of the stuff is sensationalized. Some of the stuff is scripted. But like in that first season, you know, they're really going through um, and, and going into people's homes and really waking people up. I remember there was one episode, they, um, they, they got three guys who were all bachelors living together and the, the thief guy goes through and he gets a hold of the guy's business cards. And that was like a huge wake up moment for that guy. He's like, oh my gosh, he's got your business cards. So now not only is this guy broken in, it's now he can now impersonate you because who else is going to have your business card? And this, this show was like, what, 15 years old, maybe, maybe even older. Um, so I think it kind of helps if you understand, 
if you don't take every single thing they do as 100% truth, because there's going to be some, there's going to be some exaggeration in there and that I would just watch it and see what your impressions are and say, Hey, did you identify with anything you saw there? If so, you might need to make a change to your home, but I say, watch it. I, I, I think it's fun. Outstanding. And also, um, Chris asked, when you're looking at that dorm room, would you go as far as to check the length of the screws, screws on the faceplate for the deadbolt? You know, I thought about that. That's a lot of uh, a lot of inf that's that's a common uh, piece of information. It depends. I know that a lot of those door jams are metal. Um, so, I, you know, I, you know, went in and out of dorms all through college. I worked for a university. Um, a lot of that stuff is metal. So you might not actually be able to make that upgrade to the door, but you could get uh, a door jammer. I think you can buy them in Lowe's now for like $15, $16. Uh, Master Lock makes one. It's probably not the best one on the market, but it's probably the one that you can get a hold of. And it just, it's this little prong and it sits up under the, the doorknob. And if you've got um, either really cheap industrial carpet in the room, or if it's tile, it'll keep that door from being kicked in at least a good five or six kicks, which will give you the opportunity to um, uh, to make a plan to sure. defend yourself. Or if you're on the first floor, go out the window. Uh, you can also look at getting a fire ladder, that sort of thing for an escape. Um, so yeah, it, it just really depends on the room. If you want to link, if you can make the screws stronger, absolutely, because you know the university is not going to know that you've made that change. Nobody's going to know. And finally, uh, some questions about if you're a woman, young woman, older woman living alone in your own house, what are some specific steps you can take to make your home safer? I feel like the biggest thing that you can do, I know a lot of people lay down at night and they close their eyes and people are afraid of, is that guy I rejected at the bar, did, is, did he follow me home? You know, what do I do if somebody breaks in? And I, I take all of those questions, and honestly, that was the basis for writing my book. It was, you know, I decided that I didn't want to be woken up in the middle of the night with an intruder standing over me and my wife. So I was like, how do I work that out? So um, honestly, if you were by yourself, I would say, you know, go to your, your bedroom at night and say, okay, how do I keep somebody out of this room? All right, now how do I keep somebody out of the hallway? How do I keep somebody from breaking in the house? How do I keep somebody from uh, choosing my house in the first place? How do I make my home look like a harder target? So um, with being a single person in a house, I would um, absolutely consider what you're going to use to signal for help, whether that's a cell phone or you still have a landline in your home. I actually recommend that people still have landlines just to call 911. Uh, even if you just plug a phone in and you don't actually pay for service, that phone will still call 911 if you're in the United States. Um, I would also consider getting some sort of weapon, whether that's going to be a firearm or that's going to be pepper gel, and I would train with it to know how to use it. So just kind of answer all those questions that you have, know that you can rely on yourself, because that is a big confidence booster, because even at night, when I turn the lights off, I think, okay, if somebody breaks in, I'm doing X, Y, and Z, and then from there, I'll do A, B, and C, and I just kind of give myself that confidence boost at the end of the night and know that I have a plan for what I need to do if something goes wrong. Excellent. Well, thank you, Andy, so much for coming on today. Where can people find you if they want more of this good uh, Secure Dad mojo? Sure. Uh, you can check out thesecuredad.com. I'm also the Secure Dad on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And of course, you can search for my book, uh, Home Security, The Secure Dad's Guide on Amazon. And again, look, especially for the two-parter episode Andy and I did, where we split it up, half of it's on his show, half of it's on mine. Yeah, we had a good time. Thank you so much, Andy. Yeah, man, thank you. Next up to bat is Ron Cecil, an outdoorsman, a life coach. Hello, Ron. How you doing, man? I'm well. Thanks for having me on, Jason. Excellent. So Appreciate Ron's that. here to talk a lot, especially about we know it's good to get kids outdoors. Uh, there's some research coming out now that half an hour playing outdoors can be as effective as low doses of Adderall or Adderall or Ritalin. And so, and on, on the other side of that, we're spending less and less time outdoors. Uh, somebody at one point, I can't remember who said that 
our kids are the first generation for whom the inside is more interesting than the outdoors. So to talk a little bit about safety features of being a parent who's taking your kids out there, what would you say is the biggest mistake you see most folks making when they want to go outdoors with the kids, camp and hiking, hunting, fishing, what have you? It's a good question. I, I kind of tag on to what Andy had just said is, is really run the scenarios in your head. Think of what could go wrong and play the tape forward. Um, it really starts for us as a family on the way there. So I have a, I have a box in the back of my, uh, my SUV that's got you know, all the essentials, right? I can patch a tire. I can uh, jump start my truck. I can jump start someone else's truck. I've got uh, battery backups. I've got lights. I've got a candle to, for warmth. Uh, I've got blankets, emergency blankets. I've got a fishing kit in there because my nine-year-old and I like to, you know, head off down little roads and find fishing holes. It's fun and it's just, it's there. So I've got, it starts with that. And then, and then on from there, I, I, I've been an avid outdoors person since I was a child. My dad introduced it to me. That looks different than I did when I was a kid, but um, I am really comfortable outside. I am really comfortable alone outside. I can be alone for days on end and be totally fine. And, and I know that I can more or less self-rescue if I need to. Uh, and teaching my kids how to do that if if needed is part of the fun of being outside so that looks like what does it look like to make a fire what does it look like to stay warm what does it look like if we were to get lost what would happen let's play that game let's let's play this as a as a, a lost and found kind of scenario and then from there it's it's really about are we taking extremely good care of the basics in other words are we eating when we're hungry we're making good decisions based on on uh, our brain being able to function with enough calories. Are we uh, keeping ourselves warm and dry? Uh, and then, and then I think part of the other side of that coin is, do you know how to be uncomfortable? Because <laughs> being outside can be very uncomfortable. And how long uh, can you mitigate that time? And I think about both my kids, they're city kids. We live in downtown Portland, but we are outside a lot. And um, and having the right gear, I'm, I'm, many of you have probably heard the phrase, there's no bad weather, there's only bad gear. And, and so we put a lot of effort into making sure everyone's got the right, um, you know, rain jacket and boots and lo those kinds of things so that, so that we can uh, figure all that stuff out. We can take it as it comes and, and be okay with it. Uh, one of the guests in the show recently, a fellow named Josh Burmeister, who was a SEER instructor, came on to talk about disaster preparedness. And one of the things he recommended was go camping with your kids so that if it really hits the fan, that's not the first time they've spent the night outdoors. That's super uh, smart. Yeah, that's very, now, very smart. Um, uh, Jenny Coakley asks, how does someone stay safe if they find themselves outside overnight unexpectedly? Maybe with minimal gear, maybe in a situation or a place that they weren't expecting to? That's a good question. I'm going to um, uh, offer up a book. I don't know if this is the place to say it, but there's a, a book. Um, oh, oh, gosh, the title escapes me for a second. It's going to come back. It's Deep Survival. That's what it is. Deep Survival. Do you have it? I do. Yeah. Who Lives, Who Dies, and Why? Is that, is that the subtitle? That's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I love that book. I read that book the first time years and years ago. And the interesting thing about that is, uh, in fact, I was thinking about that as I was talking about it, is, is uh, the cases of children uh, being alone overnight and, and essentially uh, reverting to kind of a primary uh, state where they're not moving, they're eating when they're hungry, they're trying to figure out how to get warm and surviving because of that versus in the, in the case of that book, uh, I think there was a Navy SEAL that, that fell out of a raft and um, pushed away rescue because he thought he could swim and ended up drowning. Um, and, and you know, you know, back to the question, what was the, could you clarify the question or say it, say it again for me? Because I was oh, just, how to, how to survive when you find yourself outside overnight unexpectedly? That's a good question. Just know, just know 
you're going to be uncomfortable, number one, and, and being okay with discomfort is, I think, something you got to deal with. That's a, that's a good question. I think, you know, just like um, Andy was talking and is like taking stock of what you got. Like, what do you have? What's going to be a tool? What, what do you need? How are you going to stay warm? How are you going to stay dry? Uh, and make a game of it. I, I, I love reading the news articles as they come up with people who've survived days on end outside and what, they, what their game plan was, following rivers, staying warm, make creating little shelters go try it i would say go try it first see if you see if you're up for it <laughs> when when i was a kid i liked to read those survivalist handbooks you know how to build a lean to how to improvise a shelter in different terrains and stuff and it is incredibly valuable knowledge just to have in the back of your mind like that okay so this is how i could convert you know a couple of flannel shirts and some sticks to a stretcher if i really needed to or how i could make a probably not super comfortable but less likely to get me hypothermia shelter yeah. um yeah. you know out in the woods so that's right you know, knowledge yeah, we've is got power. we've got all kinds of those books too they're fun i can i try to keep them around so that my kids have access to them or <laughs> keep one in the car as well so there was some banter here that I think leads to a really good question. And we got Amy talking about how her 11-year-old daughter wants a machete so she can make better arrowheads for a treehouse, which is awesome. But beyond that, yeah. I think that there is a uh, response in many parents. I'm not giving my 11-year-old a machete. I'm not putting a rifle in my 9-year-old's hands. Uh -huh. I'm not giving a Swiss Army knife to my 7-year-old. Uh, and there is the reality that, you know, tools can be dangerous if, if misused. What are some of the best ways to make sure that we're introducing tools to our kids at the right age and keep them safe while they're doing it? Because also some of these tools are really fun to play with. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I still have a scar for my very first pocket knife at <laughs> seven or eight years old, which was a, a Swiss Army knife with the Boy Scout logo as a, you know, a Cub Scout. And uh First present, got it, opened up a gift. No one had taught me that you uh, never cut towards your appendages and I cut right into my finger. So real basic, gosh, I remember I'm thinking back on the first time I showed my kids how to use a, a hatchet to split wood or, or knife to, uh, you guys have seen how you can split small logs with a, a knife and tapping it down. So, you know, really, finding age appropriate but also challenging i think because the kids gotta they want to feel like it's hard a little bit right like a, it's a bit of a challenge they want to do it themselves um you know there's a really fine line between like fire hosing the kids with information um and then also knowing when like it's just enough information to get through there making sure the muzzle is always pointed down rage never pointing a gun at anything you will not kill or destroy you know those kinds of things you know but also not having to get into like the well this is a uh, you know getting the minutia of a firearm system or something um that's a good question i'm sending my kid to an outdoor school where she will be carrying a knife and in, in, in living in a shelter that she creates with her classmates. So I think parents have their own different uh, levels of comfort around that stuff. And, and I, I'm, my comfort level is very high. <laughs> I think you have to be prepared to, to educate your kid around that a lot. And, and it, and I think every kid's a little different on what they're able to handle. I think I'd add to that, just take your first aid refresher, take the stop the bleed class. So that if something That's goes a great wrong, idea. That's a super good idea. Well, Ron, thank you so much for coming on. And we will have Ron on the show in a later season. Yeah, so thank you so much for joining us. And where can people find you and what you're doing? Go check out my podca uh, podcast, Cutting for Sign, with uh, my co-host, Daniel Pinner klein It's good stuff. Yeah, they, they had me on and for, what I, for what value I was. <laughs> so All thank right. you again, Ron. Thanks, everybody. Good seeing you. Take care. All right, next up are the two Johns, John and John of Shield Protection Products. Hello, gentlemen. I think you guys are uh, muted. There we are. How are you, sir? 
Fantastic. How are y'all? Living the dream. Excellent. Now, John and John. Uh, company shield protection products brings less than lethal self-defense options to civilians like on like most of us here and their their experiences in law enforcement and they're very expert in this sort of thing and they'll be coming on the show very soon to talk about self-defense weaponry Rhonda, you have been waiting patiently for the people who i thought would best answer your question i'm gonna scroll up to exactly where it was there but Rhonda had asked earlier, what are your thoughts on the bracelets and necklaces that you've been that we've been seeing where a woman can quickly push it to call 911? It was like immediate alert bracelets and necklaces. How do you feel about those? John Hill, you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, I, I think what you're talking about where you can quickly call 911 quickly get help I think those are a good thing in the sense that in a high stress situation you're going to lose fine motor skills so trying to get your phone out and think that you're going to dial the number and manipulate all that uh, I don't think is very realistic so if there's a button you can hit just a gross motor skill uh, I think that's a, a good resource to have uh, not for nothing, most cell phone models now, like my iPhone, if I push the, the button on the side, not the volume button, but whatever you call the other one, three times in rapid succession, it'll call 911 unless I specifically tell it not to. Yes, so but keep in mind, that mm -hmm. it's calling 911, but help is still mm -hmm. 10, 15, 20 minutes away. So you need to get out of the situation first. And that was what uh, brings us to what you guys do, because, you know, what's what's the old saying when uh, seconds count, the police are minutes away? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah. And so when John Hill and I had our initial conversation, one of the things we talked about was some of his pet peeves about objects that are sold as self-defense weaponry that are at best useless and at worst maybe harmful to the wielder, not the attacker. So could we start there a little bit about what, what kind of things you recommend people not buy for self-defense yeah i mean that i'll say this that was the whole really driving force between us starting the business is uh you have a lot of the guys are into a lot of the tactical uh tactical side of things but for everyday people there's just so many companies that sell gimmicky stuff uh you know for example we, we kind of looked around i mean anyone that sells you a, a 12 inch expandable baton as a keychain as a keychain attachment um I, I i tell people all the time if you hit me with a ruler because that's what it is you'll upset me but you won't stop me from attacking you um you know i mean half of these uh, you know nunchucks or, or throwing stars you find on some of these and it's like i i don't i've never met anyone you know, walking around that just out in the world that can use those things, that's, that's trained in those things. That's, that's not an everyday person thing. Um, I personally like the stun ring for women. It's very much geared towards women. Um, I, I, I don't like that because it encourages, uh, you know, someone to close the gap on their attacker and, and distances your friend. Um, so us both being active law enforcement, that's where we saw uh, a need that wasn't being filled. And the other thing is, is uh, we try to empower people with some knowledge and, and not just sell them a product and send them down the road. And that, I feel like that's one of the most important things because one of the, one of the delusions and misconceptions that I encounter a lot is people who think, for example, so I don't want to get mugged. I'm afraid of somebody coming into my home. I'm going to buy a gun and that's enough. They don't think about the training side of things. Could you, could you discuss the importance of training and knowledge about self-defense weaponry? Well, I think I'm gonna that let my partner take that. Go ahead. Go ahead, Icy. So we are very pro 2A. We both carry every day and we carry off duty, but sometimes a gun isn't the answer and you need something intermediate to that and you need to train there's a saying that says for every dollar you spend on your equipment you need to spend ten dollars on training so if you 
buy a rifle, one $2,000 rifle, and you only put four or 500 rounds through it, that is not enough training. You need to hit the range. Uh, if you carry pepper spray, grab you some inert pepper spray and learn how it sprays, learn how it sprays in the wind. What happens with the stream versus a cone? You know, you need to learn that the time that you're being attacked is not the time to learn how to use it. Uh, another guest on the show, Spencer Corson, who is a bodyguard to high net worth individuals and celebrities, makes the point that he lacks confidence in most people's ability to, de to deploy a handgun because he's watched people try to take a selfie with a celebrity. Yes. So when, and on your shop, you carry a number of items to help everyday people protect themselves. People who don't get professional level training, but do put in the time to become familiar with that item. What, what are some of the, mo the things you recommend most strongly? I would say right off the bat, and I, I know I'm speaking for Heisey on this too. Um, one of one of the favorite things we sell is 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 pepper spray. I, I prefer anything that's a distance tool, and anything that is a size and strength equalizer. Um, meaning, as long as you can depress the button on pepper spray, it works just as well if you're 300 pounds and bench 500, or if you're five foot two and 105 pounds versus an item, let's say like a baton. Um, I mean, a baton, you have to have a certain amount of, of strength and mass to be able to wield that. Um, but right off the rip, I, I would say uh, pepper spray. Um, I've been pepper sprayed a couple of times. I've been with a few different agencies and it, I mean, it knocks me down. I, I, it takes a fight right out of me. Uh, John Heisen, do you, do you yeah, agree to have some bad? I, I agree 100% with the uh, OC or pepper spray. I've been sprayed multiple times. And then when you fight somebody after somebody gets sprayed, you get it on you. So I've probably been exposed at least over 100 times. I would take a taser ride five times before I want to get sprayed on purpose again. And it's your biggest distance. It's your friend. And uh, pepper gel had been mentioned earlier and one of our listeners had asked, what is pepper gel? Can you talk a little bit about pepper spray, pepper foam, pepper gel? So there's, in reality- Heisey, there's Heisey has some strong opinions, so I'm gonna let you take it. <laughs> so pepper sprays are OC sprays. They have stream, they come out in stream, a cone, gels or foam. Gel is just, depending on who makes it, it's, almost like shampoo. It's a little bit easier to control and it's more of a thick, think of like a 130 weight gear oil. Um, it's pretty easy to aim um, when you get to pepper foams. Uh, one of the downfall of those are we've seen that somebody can actually take the foam and it's easier to wipe off. Um, I'm not one of those who is fortunate enough to just be able to wipe off OC or pepper spray and it not affect me. It, it hits me pretty hard. Um, problem with cones are is that uh, if you're outside and the wind catches you and you're not paying attention, there's a good chance you're getting exposed. If And if you're not ready for it, um, it's, it's shocking. And when we spray cadets in the police academy, they always ask us the day before, hey, how can we, how can we prep for this? And our, our running joke is, Go to McDonald's and stick your head in the deep fryer because that's what it's going to feel like, and that's the only way. And it's uh, so there's some pros and cons to each pepper spray or OC spray, and uh, depending on the situation, you really got to pay attention and, and train with what you carry because there's a good chance if you spray one person, you might get the th three or four people next to them. Well, thank you, gentlemen, so much for coming on today. Uh, be alert, we're going to have a full episode with uh, the two Johns about how to, about self-defense weaponry, thoughts about whether you should carry it, thoughts about what you should look at when making choices, best ways to train with it, best ways to carry it. And I'm really looking forward to that. We need so, their website. Yes, yes. What is your website, gentlemen? Thank you, Todd. Shieldprotectionproducts.com. We are also on Instagram and Facebook under the same name. Excellent. Thank you for having us. Well, thank you all for coming on. Thank uh, you. We'll
And congratulations on the 100th episode. <laughs> well, thank you guys. Moving on now to Brandy Shampoo, a uh, communications expert, author of Hearing is Not Enough, and the other author who I don't have their book on my shelf because I've loaned it out and haven't gotten it back yet. I, I fear I may not see that. I maybe needed to communicate to that person more deeply that I wanted my book back. <laughs> but Brandy is on today to talk about one of the most important safety factors of being somebody with a family responsible for, which is communicating with our kids. And whether that's communicating important safety information to them or hearing from them the things that make them feel unafraid or unempowered. So Brandy, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you very much. And I'm sure people start asking you, popping some questions into the chat very soon, but I'd like to open with, um, my 11 year old is um, beginning to show signs of terminal teenness, including growing a bit <laughs> monosyllabic when I ask questions. So what's, what are some of the best techniques for taking a monosyllabic tween or teen and having a real conversation with them? Um, well, the first thing I'd say is that, you know, most of the communicating that we do with people is nonverbal. And so there's so much behind the things that they don't say. And when they're talking in, in you know, minute instances at a time, and I have to say, you know, I have a, um, a 20 year old and a 17 year old. So we often talk in grunts and shrugs. <laughs> um, it, it's pay close attention to the words that they do use, not just to you, but through the words that they're using with other people. Because a lot of times, a lot of times you can overhear really important information if you're listening. The key is to pay attention to your child even when you're not actively engaging with them. Outstanding. And Jenny Coakley asks about what are the, some of the best ways to empower our kids to use their voice, to advocate for themselves and express their needs and boundaries, especially in a world and a structure where a lot of adults spend a lot of time telling kids to shut up and obey. Um, what are some of the best ways to empower our kids to not do that once? Well, a couple of things that I do. One of the first things is I always answer my child's questions. Now, um, you know, I tell them from the beginning, they may not like the answer that I give, but if you shut your child down and say, you know, I'll tell you when you're older, that tells them that they can't ask a question, that they don't have the right to question things. And so, you know, I've told my kids from the very beginning that whatever they ask me, be prepared because I'm going to give them a realistic answer. Um, and, and the other thing is to, you know, help them to understand that whatever feeling that they're feeling is okay. You know, especially, um, especially teens who go through a lot of feelings in a very short amount of time. Uh, and my you know, my older son is autistic, so a lot of times he doesn't understand what he's feeling. But the key is that whatever it is that you're feeling is okay because it's yours. That, you know, the way we choose to express it may be wise choices or poor choices. And I'll tell my kids all the time, you know, are you sure you're making a wise choice here? Would you like to rethink that? And, and that's a phrase I use a lot when they're, uh, you know, they're getting a little too big for their bridges. And I have to just kind of say, you know, are you sure your word choice is the right one that you want to use? Because I don't want to say that I'm not validating what they're feeling because what they're feeling, what they're expressing is valid. Um, and then the other thing, teach your kids a lot of words. You know, I have a dear friend, um, her name is Dr. Sheila Sapp. And one of the things she talked about when we were, um, first starting to work together was the fact that as a principal, she was seeing more and more children come into her, she was a principal of an elementary school, come into her school that lacked the words to communicate their needs at all. And it wasn't that they didn't have the same needs, but they couldn't enunciate them. And it's because as a society, we're losing words. 
And, and so one of the things, you know, it's not just listening and communicating to your children, but helping them to find the words to express what they want. And then, you know, like I said, letting them know that whatever it is that they're expressing is okay to do so because they have a right to express themselves in appropriate ways. Well, expand a little bit on appropriate because then there's that other place where the child is getting out of hand with their emotions and is turning from expression into losing control. If we, as the kids start getting larger, maybe they're starting to act out physically in a way that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. What are some things that we can do to teach them, not only just with the boundaries between a parent and a child, but also how not to set off an authority figure at school or in the world who might respond in a dangerous way? Um, what are some ways we can talk to them about that while still respecting the fact that their feelings are their feelings? Um, well, one of the things that I do is I give my children a space in which they're free to express themselves wherever they want, and that is their room. If you would like to, you know, yell and holler and do whatever you want, you can do that in your space as much as you want to. But when you're interacting with people, it's all about healthy communication. When you're communicating with someone else, if you don't communicate in a way that they can receive it, your message is not getting through. You know, um, and there's a lot of things that we say in anger. There's a lot of things that as adults that we say in anger. And children need to know that words have power and that if they're saying things in anger, you know, I'll tell them all the time that, hey, why don't we give it a minute and then let's come back and discuss this? Because you know, I can tell, you know, I can tell with my children, and it comes through watching them that they've reached a point where our conversation is not going to be useful. Either they've reached a point or I've reached a point. But it's our job as an adult to acknowledge that. Because they haven't learned, you know, they a lot of times haven't learned what that point is. And that was one of the most important points I thought that you brought up in your interview on the show about how as a parent, we can say, hey, you know what, I need I need to take five. I'm, uh, I'm angry, I'm freaked out, and you're showing those, you're sharing that vocabulary with them, and you're modeling an adult, acknowledging their emotions, but also not letting them become the problem of the person that they love that they're communicating with. I thought that was a very valuable insight. Right. And a lot but, of times I'll go back even after the incident and you know, I'll say, well, you used some words that were really hurtful. You know, how do you think that made me feel? And especially with my, my younger son, he's only eight. He'll be like, sad. And I'm like, yeah, that, that kind of hurt my feelings when you did that. So what can we do next time? And he's like, well, next time I should say that. And I was like, yeah. And so when the next time occurs, I'll say, remember how we talked about we were going to handle this? Um, that works about 10% of the time with him at eight. But by the time they're 12 and 13 and 14, you know, they begin to get used to it. It's setting a, a habit of this is how we communicate appropriately. Uh, uh, Rita Robinson asked a related question. And I have my own answer, but, I, but you're much smarter about this than me. What do you say when a child says, I hate you, to a parent? Now, the time that happened to me, I fist bumped the nearest adult and said, mission accomplished. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but what, what do you say? And uh, yeah, I think you touched on that a little bit in what you were just saying. But what, what, what is a good response to the kind of looking at you and saying, I hate you? Depends on what's going on at the time. A lot of times, um, because, you know, I do have very emotional children and, and that's come out several times. And if it's a situation in which you can diffuse it with sarcasm and humor, then by all means, and I've done that. However, a lot of times I'll just say, you know, those are really hurtful words. I still love you. And I'm gonna say about a third of the time they start to cry, which 
may seem like a bad thing, but children are so full, even as an adult, they're so full of emotion and every emotion that they have, the younger they are, the more prevalent it is, is the most powerful emotion they've ever felt, right? And so if they're scared, children don't just get a little scared, they're terrified. And they don't just get a little happy, they're like joy, you know, like um, that movie with the little emotions. That's what they are most of the time. And so when they're like, oh, I hate you, they're running on anger, but anger is often a cover for fear or for sadness. And a lot of times it's, I understand that's very hurtful, but I still love you. Almost like cracks that armor and then they begin to cry and then you can have a discussion because you have to get past that anger. And e teens are so angry and confused a lot of the time <laughs> um, because you know their bodies are changing and the world is changing and there's so much stress and so much pressure and so the world is so dangerous inherently and they're trying to figure out how to respond to that without you. But, you know, they just need to be reminded that, hey, I'm listening. Even if you're not talking to me, I'm still listening. Wow. Well, Brandy, thank you so much for taking a little time out of your busy schedule. Brandy's presenting, is it tomorrow or did you just finish? Presenting no, I'm, I'm presenting tomorrow, yes, at a conference. Excellent. So thank you so much for taking the time tonight. Uh, where can folks find your information, find you? Um, our website is exploringexpression. Dot com exploring expression singular all one word dot com excellent thank you so much brandon absolutely and congratulations thank you <laughs> and last but certainly not least the only repeat offender on the show so far rita r robison consumer journalist and product safety expert is on today uh rita go ahead and unmute yourself there And Rita's had two shows on various aspects of product safety for parents. And I'd like three. to start with three. three. Yeah, we, got, we oh, did yeah, an extra did, one on bonus. toys. Yeah, we did that bonus episode at Christmas, which yes. if I really think about it, that probably makes us the 101st episode, but uh, <laughs> moving right along. Yes, it, it was it was just a little extra. <laughs> yeah, at the Christmas time. Yes. But uh, so Rita, I'd like to start with what is the least known product safety concern that you've encountered in your years? The one that people should bloody well know, but don't. Well, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you, Jason, on your work. I love Safest Family on the Block because <laughs> I've written about these topics for years, but consumers just are not tuned into product safety. So the biggest thing that I try to do and educate people about is recalls. Uh, there are dangerous products out there. Um, very few automobile recalls are pretty successful, like 70% because the manufacturer knows where you are. And so they tell you about that your car is being recalled. But if you have a toy, um, all kinds of miscellaneous products, um, you know, there could be a dangerous toy in there uh, or product. And so the story I tell is um, when I first started out, I used to get news releases from the Consumer Product Safety Commission and it was before the internet. So they came in the mail. Well, I got one and it was about a shop, shop light. It was electrocuting people. So I went out to the garage looked at, at what my former husband had there and he had one of those uh, shop lights. So I took it back to the store and got a refund. But the reason I knew about it was because I was a consumer journalist. So um, the Consumer Product Safety Commission has uh, information that you can sign up for and you can get recalls that come into your mail. And I would certainly suggest it because it isn't just toys. It isn't just infant sleeping products, which are a big thing lately because of inclined sleepers. Um, it's all kinds of stuff. And I'd like to just say a word about the inclined sleepers 
because one thing Jason and I have talked about is just because it's on the market and is being stole, sold in the store doesn't mean it's safe. So the incline sleeper, which uh, is a 30 degree baby bed, um, have just been a lot, millions recalled and a safety standard has just been adopted because they did a study and they found out that the only safe um, inclined sleepers were at 10 degrees. So the company uh, dreamed up inclined sleepers. They just started selling them. And years later, uh, 90, about 90 children have died. So um, babies should be put on their backs on a flat surface. The crib sheet should be tight fitting. They should be in a gown that's like a sack. Um, don't get bumpers. There are no safety standards yet for bumpers and cribs. And that's all of those things come, come to us through often the, the consumer safety product Consumer Product Safety Commission. Right. And one of the things that you mentioned in the show is even when you're, you know, you're having planning your baby shower, filling out that that registry list, even then is when you can do the product research and look for that specific product. When grandma brings over a toy or a stroller, you can look it up right there online and find out if there are recalls or problems. Because unfortunately. We've got so many cool baby gadgets now, but not a lot of them are tested before they go to, to market. And you've got strollers that cut off fingers and these weird half bed, half chair incline sleepers that I don't even, I still don't understand the point of them that are killing kids because it puts too much pressure on the lungs. And it's- Well, what it, happens in the incline yeah. sleeper is, um, you know, the parents cooking in the kitchen, the kids in the incline sleeper, at at 30 degrees and, and it, you know, the baby's head is heavy and the baby slumps over. So then their, you know, their nose gets mashed, you know, into the, into the mattress. So it's just a, a faulty design. And it just took years and years for the Consumer Product Safety Commission. They finally got a standard done. It was just adopted a couple of weeks ago and, um, but there are no standards yet for bumpers. So um, again, just because it's on the market, it doesn't mean that it's safe. Yeah. And kind of regularly checking up, I think people are starting to understand the importance of, for example, going and checking your credit once a year, once every other year, or twice a year rather. And if you have your, um, you know, your security camera, you gotta go in and check the logs at minimum once a week. And also just getting on the Consumer Product Safety Commission and checking for the things your kids are interacting with and we're interacting with should go on that list, I think. Yeah, and every week I, I, I look through the recalls that have happened. I pick the biggest, <laughs> you know, I pick the biggest one because on my blog, I can't, you know, I can't write about all of them. But it just, and then at the end, I say, for other recalls, see www.recalls.gov just to get people educated in the fact that, you know, they, they need to pay attention. Well, Rita, thank you so much for coming on wait, today. Wait, wait, yeah, but yeah, I want to say one more thing. Yes, please. Scams and fraud, oh, you know, yeah. just, you have to be so careful. If anyone says to you, um, I've got this great rental car um, and, it's a, and it's a really low price and you're all excited and they say, I want you to, to pay with a gift card. You know, that's a big red flag. Anyone who wants you to pay with a gift card don't have anything to do with them because it's a scam. And, it's, and, and you, you think, you would think that people would know that, but one woman um, was scammed and, and she said, there I was, you know, just going to buy gift card after gift card after gift card to pay these guys $10,000. So, you know, we just need to educate people and tell them about fraudsters because they're there. 
uh, all the time and the rental car, you know, because rental cars are now um, in, in scarce supply. That's what, and so what fraudsters do is they take their techniques and they adopt it to the latest thing that comes up. And so rental cars is one of the latest things. Absolutely, mate. That financial security is a whole other factor of family safety. One of the things I love about Rita's shows is, you know, nobody ever spent money on a movie ticket to go watch Jason Statham baby proof his house. But if you look at the statistics, that's, that's what's gonna get your kid. It's not a stranger abduction. It's, it's a car accident. It's getting their neck tangled up in blind, in the blind string that was left low. It's an accidental poisoning. So it's not the sexiest information on the planet, but something all of us parents should pay more attention to. Oh, and so, cribs, cribs. Uh, do, do not buy a secondhand crib. Uh, one woman, her child died because she bought a secondhand crib. And you wanna do that, you know, to be environmental, but, um, you know, you gotta get a new one. Um, the, the slats need to be, uh, the standard is the size of a soft drink can. So you got to get the crib. Um, you know, it's just tragic when you, when you read the stories about the children that, that, that die in these consumer products. It's very preventable injuries. And is that the slats or the space between the slats that needs to The space be between the slats is the size of a soda can. Uh, too, too thin to fit the head through, too wide to trap and damage a limb, right? Excellent. Well, thank you, Rita, and thank you, everybody, for coming to the 100th episode. I really appreciate all of your time and all of your intelligence. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the various, various uh, presenters who are still here, I think most of you should know one another. So unless you uh, tell me otherwise, I'm going to send out an email just giving everybody uh, at least Facebook or Instagram contact information so you can conspire to help each, other's at, each other out. Yeah, I'm available to talk about consumer products and recalls anytime anyone wants to know more about it because like I say, I've written about it for years. It's not a sexy topic, but Jason, he... he um, you know, he likes to share the information. Well, I, I'm not a smart person, but I listen to smart people and bring them on my show. So <laughs> thank you all, everybody, so much. Um, looking forward to seeing you for episode 151. I really appreciate everything everybody's done to support the channel. And once again, if you'd like to help out a little, hop over onto the Patreon page. I'll put the link in the show notes and find out if you can throw five bucks or three bucks at the program. Thank you all so much for everything, and we'll see you all next time.